Acts chapter 24, verse 22. But Felix, who was rather well informed about the way, adjourned the hearing with the comment, when I see us, the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he ordered the centurion to keep him, that him is Paul, in custody, but to let him have some liberty and not to prevent any of his friends from taking care of his needs. Some days later, when Felix came with his wife, what's his wife's name? Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard Paul speak concerning faith. Would you say the word faith? Faith. He heard Paul speak concerning faith in Christ Jesus as he discussed justice, self-control, and the coming judgment. Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I'll send for you. At the same time, he hoped that money, would you say the word money, <laughs> would be given to him by Paul. And for that reason, he used to send for him very often and converse with him. My Bible says he hoped that Paul would give him a bribe. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And since he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Look at verse 25 again. As he discussed judge, justice and self-control and coming judgment, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I'll send for you. I want to share a sermon that's titled this morning. The sermon thought is, what is it going to take? Amen. Repeat these words with me. What, what? is it going to take? <laughs> Say it one more time. What is it going to take? Brothers and sisters, each of us live in a community. We have family, yes, but we also have community. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you know that Matthew 28 says, Go ye all into the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, and lo, I am with you always. This is called the Great Commandment. Go and make some disciples. If you're reading the King James, it says, go and teach my disciples. And so if there's going to be some teaching, there's got to be some learning. And so we are charged as Christians to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be trying to replicate ourselves. We're supposed to be out and about sharing if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Where would I be? We're supposed to be the ones that when people are downcast and doubting and diseased and disappointed, that we would say, you know what? I was downcast, disappointed, diseased and such. And the Lord Jesus has come inside and made a difference in my life. But guess what, brothers and sisters? As you are trying to share, as you you're trying to carry out the Great Commission, you'll find that sometimes you're talking to your loved ones, your family members, the folks that you work out with, and it's like talking to a brick wall. Amen. Amen. You start talking about Jesus, and boy, the whole conversation changed. The whole environment changed. The countenance changed. There was a sweetness and a gaiety and a laughter. And you start talking about church and the frown comes up and the brows are furrowed. And the hands start tightening and tension arises. And you say to yourself, my goodness, why is it that when I talk about God, something happens and we tend to fall out? Why is it when I start telling you about the difference that Jesus has made in my life, we can talk about everything else, but as soon as I start talking about God, as soon as I start talking about how the church is impacting my life favorably, as soon as I start talking about how I'm going to Bible study and learning how to pray and getting up in the morning and seeking the Lord's favor and faith, then all of a sudden, I don't have the same kind of friendships anymore. All of a sudden, I don't get my calls returned anymore. And I start being the bearer of name calling. You think you all that now. You think you're so holy. Why is it? We can talk about everything else but Jesus. I have no pushback, no uncomfortable. But when you start talking about the Lord Jesus, 
Before I tell you, I tell you what, why don't we just agree to disagree? We can be friends if you stop talking to me about your church. I'm sick of hearing about your church. I find myself, when I'm trying to share the good news of Jesus Christ, asking the question that poses the sermon title this morning, what is it going to take? Have you ever had somebody that's in your life that has gotten off on a, a drug addiction? Are you trying with everything in you to see a change is shifting in their lives? And you can see the precipitous decline in health and dignity and such, and you're just like, man, what's it going to take? If you felt that before, if you've ever tried to talk to somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ and you felt like they just weren't hearing you, in exasperation, you said, what is it going to take? This sermon is for you today. I like to be personal because it helps you to understand that I'm just like you. I have a friend and he needed me to write a letter for him to help him to deal with some legal matters. And I told him I'd be glad to do so. But I also realized that I would like to know that he's on a positive trajectory and I have seen that change in his life. And I want to say to anybody here that if you know somebody that's gotten into legal trouble, legal trouble doesn't have to have the last word. Can you say amen? amen. Just because you've been incarcerated, just because you've had to stand before a judge and be pronounced guilty, does not mean that you're not valuable in the sight of God. And it does not mean that your life is over. Is there anybody here that knows that God works in turning things around? So my friend and I were talking and I was hoping that I could be a blessing to him. And I realized as many of the things that we talk about, every time I start talking about the Lord, I get pushback, I get resistance. We were talking very recently, and it just felt like it wasn't in the natural. It felt like it was something spiritual. Everything that I tried to bring forth, there was a, a rebuttal. There's all this theorizing and, theolo and theological discourse. Why do bad things happen to good people? I said, I don't know, but you got a problem in your soul that you told me about, and something ain't working. Amen. He said, well, what about those Catholic priests that molested those children? I said, I can't know about that, but I know ain't nothing wrong with Jesus. Amen. Amen. What about preachers who were taking advantage and stealing all the money and sexing all the women? I don't know about all that, but I do know that ain't nothing wrong with Jesus. Right. So I'm trying to keep getting back to the Jesus thing, the Jesus thing. But guess what? It didn't work. At least not yet. So I got to thinking about that because it was heavy on my mind. I said, well, let me go to the scripture and find out if I can find some remedy for my soul's malady. Because if you ever really wanted somebody to know Christ like you know him and you can't seem to see it happen, it can jack you up. Can you say amen? amen. It really can. So I found this passage of scripture. Now, you all might remember from Acts chapter 8 that the Apostle Paul used to be called Saul. And he was a persecutor of the church. He was, as King James says, he was breathing out murderous threats. And so the old priest used to say he went from being a murderer to a missionary from a, from a, uh, a person that persecuted the one who preached the gospel. And so this Paul, who used to be Saul, is all of a sudden finding himself before the magistrates. He's hemmed up in a Roman jail cell for advancing the cause of Jesus Christ. The people who were followers of the, quote, way, the way of Jesus. Christ. Remember John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but by me. This kind of theology, this kind of discussion about God was causing trouble for the Jewish people who were being subjugated by the Romans. And so the Apostle Paul was in jail. 
He finds himself dealing with a man called Felix, a man who's in power. And the text says that Felix knows something about Jesus. And every now and then, Felix and his wife, Drusilla, would get together and say, let's hear from the preacher man. Call him up here and let him talk. And so the Bible says that the Apostle Paul, when he started talking, he talked about justice. He talked about judgment to come and righteousness. And you can imagine, you would think that if he's in jail, the thing that he would be talking about is, how am I going to get out of here, man? That's why the text says that Felix brought him forth expecting a bride. Felix was like, yo, if you pay me some money, you can get up out of here. But the Apostle Paul never offered any money. I would never know for no bride. He offered what was in the abundance of his heart. He wanted to talk to him about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the church say amen. amen. So the text said Paul gave his message on justice and self-control and judgment to come. And Felix got frightened. Look at what the Bible says. Verse 25. Go away for the present. And when I have an opportunity, I will send for you. Y'all see that? Go away for the present, and when I have an opportunity, I'll send for you. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I give it to you like a feather? This is kind of what he says. Paul is trying to tell him about how he needs to get right with God, and he's trying to say, you know what? Cut all that. I really don't want to hear you talking to me about that. In fact, you need to leave right now, and I'll holler at you when I get ready for you. But I'm tired of hearing you talking about the Lord. Can you say amen? Now that's rough talk, but that's really what's going on here. Squash that, you bounce, and maybe when I get ready, you'll talk to me about Jesus. Amen. So because of that, I want to give you some words today, and I hope that they'll prove helpful. The first word is commitment. Would you say the word commitment? Would you say it one more time? Let me tell you this, brothers and sisters, when you are in need of some direction from God, because you're trying to talk to your grandkids, you're trying to talk to your daughter, you're trying to talk to your wife, your husband, your spouse, your friend, your loved one about Jesus, and you feel like, I don't know what it's going to take, because I'm talking to a brick wall, I need you to think the first word is commitment. And then what I need to say to you is this, interest in is not the same as commitment to. Let the church say amen. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Interest in is not the same as commitment to. Felix was interested. Come on here, preacher. Tell me something about that Jesus. And when Paul started talking about the judgment to come and righteousness and justice, Felix said, I'm not trying to. He was interested in, but he was not willing to make a commitment to. And I just stopped by to tell somebody here today that you will know when somebody has made a commitment to. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me talk to a sister that's been gone with the brother for a long time. You can talk about getting married. You can make plans about getting married. You can read books and look at diamonds and share fantasies and talk about how we're going to have a white picket fence and you and me, baby, till the wheels go all fall off. But interest in marriage is not the same thing as commitment to marriage. And so today we got two young people and sister stood up and Lauren said, look, I am engaged. That ring shows commitment. Say amen. Amen. I know I'm right about this. It's tight, but it's right. Interest in ain't the same thing as commitment to. And so when we're talking to our loved ones about Jesus, at some point, you want to help them to make a commitment. It's one thing to be going together. It's another thing to make it serious. When I was a kid, we used to write a little note to a girl and say, will you go with me? We had a social contract. Amen. Y'all remember? Huh? You would check the box. And we had a social contract and we broke up because we'd be on the schoolyard ground and he said, uh-uh, I broke up with her. She said, uh-uh, you broke up with me. Do we understand commitment? Say the word commitment. Amen. Interesting ain't the same thing as commitment to let the church say amen. amen. But not only do I want to say a word about commitment, I want to say a word about conviction. Say the word conviction, conviction. I find it interesting that in verse 25 it says that Apostle Paul is talking about self-control, justice, and the judgment to come. And what you're going to find out is you start talking to your loved ones about the Lord and how God is making a difference in your life. What's going to happen is the Spirit of the Lord starts moving and bringing conviction. Say the word conviction. Conviction. A strong understanding that the presence of God is there. And what you're going to find is as soon as you start making progress, sometimes your friends will say, hold up, wait a minute. I don't want to talk about that anymore. 
Am I right about it? Let me tell you how I know. When conviction helps, when conviction hits, sometimes we don't like it. So let me have a little fun. Denise has been making steps to health improvement. And so she's making better food choices, huh? Going to yoga and cutting out certain bad things from the diet. She would like me to do the same. Amen. When she starts talking about health too long, then I change the subject. <laughs> Interest in ain't the same as commitment to. And when conviction starts to happen, when you know somebody's trying to help you, sometimes what happens is we'll run away from the help. I'm saying to somebody here today is that when you're talking to somebody and the conviction happens and they run, that doesn't mean that it's over yet. You know that God is moving when conviction is happening. You say amen. amen. Sooner or later, I'm going to get to the yoga class. <laughs> Apostle Paul, when Felix was on field, Apostle Paul's preaching, Felix is on the line. He says, hold up, man. That's enough of that. We'll talk about that later. Talk to you about commitment. Talk to you about conviction. The next word is continuance. Would you say it with me, please? Continuance. Text doesn't sell it, doesn't tell us all that's going on in Felix's life, but I feel that this is what is happening. Felix has been so caught up in his life choices. He's been so caught up in being a man of power and privilege. And he's been doing it for so long that when the conviction of the Holy Spirit is moving on Felix, he says, no, I don't want to talk about that anymore. And I just stopped by to tell somebody here today that you can be in wrong so long that you can convince yourself that wrong is right. Felix, how long have you been believing that wrong is right? Felix, my brother, how long have you continued in behavior that is not pleasing unto God? I have several friends that beat cocaine habits, and one of the things one of my friends gave me is a recommendation to read a book called The Big Book. And this is the book that people who have addictions read. There's a whole lot of great information in there. And what the big book says is this, is that people, when they're in their addiction, they don't realize that their behavior is something wrong with it. They've been acting crazy for so long, crazy seems right. And so they go in and take money out of their mother's pocketbook and then go steal from the shore and then go put their lives in jeopardy for a $25 rock to get high for a few minutes and they think that that makes sense. Because I've been doing it for so long, wrong seems like right. And sometimes when we're trying to talk to people that have been in a bad road and a bad way for a long time, they've been doing it so long that even after they come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, they still got them ways. Amen. Huh? There's a woman that we used to pastor right here. She got delivered from that cocaine, but she still had them on rough street ghetto ways. She come to me and ask me for money all the time. And one time she talked to me like I was a trick. I was like, who do you think you're talking to, girl? You're not the same person no more. And if a person has continued, say the word continue. In a behavior for a long time, sometimes when you talk to them about Jesus, you feel like you're going to ask yourself, what is it going to take? Let the church say amen. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. The last word is, is not really evidenced in the text, but I'm bringing it to you because when you highlight the problem, you ought to have a solution. And so the final word is the last C word, and the word is crave. Would you say it with me, please? Crave. Crave to have a, a yearning, to want something very deeply. Have you ever had a craving for something? Sometimes when you're trying to lose weight. Lord have mercy. And I haven't told you about those aggressive Oreos that live in my house. They're aggressive. 
they're aggressive, the Oreos are aggressive. And when I come in, it seemed like they didn't have a meet before I got there. There's one of them, the ringleader. And Sister Rhonda, they tackle me. And one of them holds my bottom lip down, and the other one grabs the top lip. And then they just jump in, they start filing in one after another. And they put the milk in, they involved the milk too. Sometimes they get the ice cream in the milk and the ice cream and the Oreos. They, they get me, they hold me down. But sometimes I can't blame it on the aggressive Oreos. I just have a craving. And I open up the bag and I, before I know it, Lord have mercy. And I start making excuses. I say, boy, they don't make as many Oreos in the box as they used to. I'll be lying to myself. Because I don't want to admit that I ate that many. We know what it's like to crave. And I'm saying to you that if you're talking with somebody and you're feeling like, what is it going to take? Make sure that you have a craving for God. Say amen. Amen. I want to use the word craving purposefully. As long as we have that come see, come saw, take it or leave it attitude, ain't no big thing if they decide to, just, to try Jesus or not, that's not going to get it these days. We're living in some rough times. So here's some biblical support. Genesis 32, you'll hear Jacob saying as he's wrestling with the Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's craving. Say amen. amen. Psalm 63. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My flesh longeth for thee. My soul thirsteth for thee as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That's craving. Mm -hmm. Psalm 42. As a deer <sighs> panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. That's craving. That's the kind of love that we're going to have to have for God. Amen in order to help those who when we talk to them we feel like what is it going to take? But can I say this to you as it relates to my experience just this week? I told my friend he said well let's go out to the beach and talk about this thing. If I could just put my feet in the water I believe that I'll get some clarity. So we went out to the beach and he stood out in the sand. And every time I tried to tell him about what God would do in his life, he had something to tell me that why that wouldn't work. And we walked along the sand for a little while. And as we've been talking for a full hour, I'm listening, trying to figure out a way. God helped me to say the right things to my friend who's got a hole in his soul. So we drove back. And then he said this to me. He said, well, Mac... If I could just have a miracle, like in the Bible, he said, I'd be with you, man. I'd be going around saving souls like you do. I said, what did you say? So clearly he has an understanding of what to do. But there's a wall in the way. And I said, well, your brother... How about this? How about you just take in some more additional, some additional information? See, you're making a decision, something about what happened to you when you was 12, and we almost 50. What I want to believe is that when we are trying to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and there are bumps in the way, and it feels like you're not going to be able to cross that bridge, that, that, the devil doesn't have the last word. Amen. I'm surprised that I'm looking at you, some of you here today, and I don't see any light on in your face. I'm surprised about that. Because I know one thing, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I'm so glad that the devil didn't have the last word. I'm so glad that it looks beyond our faults sees our need. Because I suppose that somewhere along the way somebody might have been thinking about me and saying, what is it going to take? But his grace is sufficient. Amen. Don't stop talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. I understand that commitment too is not the same as interest in. 
understand that the conviction of the Holy Spirit will help and move mightily. Understand that continuance can be a problem, but that, that doesn't have to have the last word. And let's crave the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's clap our hands to the glory of God.